we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on from nausea and vomiting and, and move to constipation and diarrhea, something that I know both of you guys do a lot of research on and um, have a great session set up for us next. Bill, do you want to introduce? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, so we're, we're first going to have a um, discussion by... Uh, That's right. Oh, that's what I want. Oh, great. By Dr. Lembo on physician, physician introduction on constipation. Uh, we're next going to have the patient perspective by Dr. or by Aaron Slater. And then thirdly, we're going to have the physician introduction on diarrhea by Dr. Brooks Cash. Uh, and then finally, a patient perspective on diarrhea by Ann Sirota. My name is Dr. Anthony Lembo. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I practice at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, my talk, which is part of the Nancy and Bill Norton Patient Education Series, is entitled Physician Introduction on Constipation. Const chronic constipation carries a heavy burden on patients as well as society. It's estimated that one in seven people suffer from chronic constipation. It affects the elderly more so than younger people, women more, oops, women more than men, and it's the fourth most common GI symptom, symptom prompting outpatient clinic visits resulting in greater than 3 million outpatient clinic visits. And the estimated costs in 2013 alone uh, range from $1,900 to $7,500 per year per patient. In 2011, national costs for ER visits exceeded $1.6 billion. So you can see from this information that constipation is very common. It affects a large group of, of the population and has a heavy toll on the uh, medical system as far as costs. This slide shows you the worldwide prevalence of constipation. It's not only a problem in the United States, but it's a problem that affects people for, throughout the world, independent of their, their race their, uh, or their diet that they consume. As you can see, uh, both in the United States and Canada, there's a fairly high incidence of it, but it also affects people in China, Australia, um, and South America, and throughout Europe as well. Now, when we think of constipation, there are many symptoms that can be comprised of that. Um, so when a patient comes to see me and says that they complain of constipation, I have to ask them, what do you mean by that? And here is a study that was done in Canada a few years ago where they asked people in the public, not necessarily patients, uh, if, if they reported constipation and if they said yes, what type of symptoms they experience. And this, this shows you that data. And you can see the most common symptom associated with, with constipation was straining, a hard or lumpy stools, incomplete evacuation or emptying, stools cannot be passed, abdominal fullness, infrequent stools, interestingly enough, that is less than three bowel movements per week, which is outside the 95% confidence interval for what a normal person would have in the United States, represented only just under 40% of people who report themselves to be constipated. So it's not the number one symptom when someone refers to themselves as being constipated. Now, a few years ago, the Rome um, Committee came up with a new a definition for constipation. They called it functional constipation. Other people call it chronic idiopathic constipation. And because we know that there are a number of symptoms associated with it, the Rome, the Rome criteria includes a total of six different symptoms. And for most of them, they need to be present for at least a quarter of the bowel movements. And those include the symptoms that we just saw, straining, hard lumpy stools, sensation of incomplete evacuation, interrupted obstruction, uh, manual maneuvers, or the infrequent stools of less than three bowel movements per week. And loose stools should be rarely present without laxative use, and they do, shouldn't meet the, be able to meet the criteria for irritable bowel syndrome, because otherwise they fit into the IBS with constipation uh, category. And in order to be chronic, patients have to have, have fulfill these symptoms for at least three months with an onset of at least six months prior uh, to the diagnosis. Now, when you have so experienced constipation and when it is chronic, 
there are a number of things that we should rule out before we consider to be functional a constipation or chronic idiopathic constipation. The slides list out some of them. Now, most of the time it is functional uh, or chronic idiopathic. The secondaries are less, are less common, but these are some of the ones to consider. Now, the number one cause is, in my experience is medications. We see a number of different medications that are associated uh, with constipation. We all know that narcotics or opioids uh, can slow down the gut and, and are invariably are, are, um, cause constipation. Calcium channel blockers, um, are also very common, calcium supplements, anticholinergics, just to go down the list, there's a number of different medications. So uh, anybody who's on, on a number of medications should really look at the package insert to make sure that that's not the trigger for it. And usually it's temporally related. Um, less likely there be mechanical obstruction, such as a, a cancer or something blocking it, particularly if it's chronic, metabolic, our endocrine disorders are, are rare. I've listed some of them here. Neurological disorders are very commonly associated with constipation, but again, these are uh, pretty obvious uh, when they're uh, present. Psychiatric disorders, people who are depressed tend to be constipated, and it can constipation can improve when the constipation, when the depression improves. College of vascular pregnancy are all things to consider. But let's focus in on functional constipation because this is really the most common disorder. We think of three different subtypes of constipation, which are shown on the right, normal transit, slow transit, or defecatory disorder. And defecatory disorder can overlap with both normal transit and slow transit uh, constipation. As you can see on the left hand slide, there are a number of disorders that are associated with these subtypes. There's diminished colonic propulsion or the way that colon contracts and moves, uh, which is associated with slow transit constipation. And the defecatory disorder, there's, there is uh, inability to relax the anal sphincter and relax the pelvic floor muscles in association uh, with bowel movements. And normal transit really overlaps the most with irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And this slide shows you some of the overlap that can exist. And we think of these, these two disorders, that is IBS with constipation and functional, functional constipation is really, being, is really overlapping a continuum. So the more that the patient is in pain, uh, experiencing pain frequently and regularly and associated with bowel movements, the more likely it is to be IBS with constipation. If someone has more severe constipation, the more likely it is to be uh, functional constipation. So <clears throat> this slide just shows you that the initial diagnosis that we do when we see someone with uh, chronic constipation, we do a thorough medical history, physical exam, and importantly, we do a digital rectal examination. And this is this is really to look at the pelvic floor muscles, the way they relax when we ask someone to bear down like they're having a bowel movement. The pelvic floor should be able to relax several centimeters and the puborectalis muscle, which is a muscle that makes the rectum go at an angle, should be able to relax um, as well. So that's a very helpful uh, part of the examination. We look for alarm features and, <clears throat> and those include weight loss, blood in the stools, or someone with a new onset of constipation over the age of 50 or 60 uh, years, progressively worsening uh, constipation or family history of colorectal cancer would all be considered um, you know, alarm features. And in those people, we would want to investigate further. We want to consider doing a colonoscopy, for example, uh, to make sure that the, we didn't miss a cancer or a polyp um, or other causes for then treat appropriately. But if, the, if alarm features are absent, then we really want to look at lifestyle factors. So we want to look at the amount of fiber that someone's you're taking, the fluid intake, and physical activity, because these three things can really help people move their bowels uh, better. And if they haven't been maximized, they really should before going on to the next step, which is an osmotic laxative, stimulant laxative, or other medications like pro-secretory or pro-kinetic um, agents. Okay, so and then on the far right, we look for secondary causes for constipation. And as we listed some of those in the previous slide, when those are present, we'll treat those first. For example, removing the offending medication uh, when that's present uh, for that. So it is important to look at the subtypes of constipation as we just discussed. So when a rectal evacuation disorder is present, um, and that we would do either based on our digital exam 
um, or when available, we may do some additional testing. And this would be testing of the anal rectal structure and function. Most common test would be like an anal rectal motility study, which uh, measures the pressures on the anal sphincter and the ability to evacuate a balloon or doing a defecography, which is an x-ray of someone having uh, with a contrast in the rectum to see how well the, uh, the rectum moves when trying to push that contrast out. And when those are abnormal, um, then <clears throat> someone may be diagnosed with the rectal evacuation or a defecatory disorder. And that, and those patients are best treated with biofeedback therapy. And this oftentimes is done in conjunction with some with medications, but really it is the biofeedback therapy that can uh, really change uh, their long-term uh, course. So if someone has, if the anal rectal structure and function tests are normal, uh, then we would consider doing a colon transit test. And that's to see if they have normal transit versus abnormal or slow transit constipation. And really, as you can see that the, the treatments are fairly similar. We, for both, we would consider pro-secretory agents. We also consider pro-kinetic agents, prescription uh, medications, which are available through your physician. Um, we may also be giving some stimulant, some uh, adding stimulant laxatives or even enemas. And the patients with very severe slow transit constipation, this is very rare in our practice, but it, it happens several times per year. They may end up having to have surgery to remove uh, their colon because it's so refractory. The other group with normal transit, we consider it usually treating with medications. We almost never take out their colon um, in, that, in those cases. So in summary, constipation is a common problem that impacts patients' lives and it has a significant economic impact on our health system. Functional constipation is the most common cause for constipation, but we must consider secondary causes as well. Subtypes of functional constipation include slow transit, normal transit, and defecatory disorder. And the defecatory disorder is very important to uh, diagnose because the treatment is biofeedback therapy. Treatments in general for constipation include lifestyle modifications, diet, particularly fiber, exercise, and fluids, as we mentioned. Laxatives can be used, including osmotic and stimulant laxatives. Prescription medications such as pro-secretory and pro-kinetic agents are also available through your physician. And as I already mentioned, biofeedback can be helpful for people with a defecatory disorder, so we really do want to identify them when, they, um, when present. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Erin and I'm going to talk about constipation, or more specifically, constipation, belly pain, and my life. It seems like every other commercial on TV is for some new medication. And the number one that and the number one side effect, constipation or diarrhea. And having worked in a hospital for almost 10 years as a dietitian, I can tell you the number one topic when I visit patients, constipation or diarrhea. But what if you were born that way? If you saw my previous presentation, you know that I was born with a stomach ache. And come to my house some afternoon and my mom will tell you stories about how she chased me around the living room, trying to give me medication as a two-year-old. And how I would make her late for work almost every day because I was stuck in the bathroom. And during elementary school, we would all line up in two rows during bathroom break and I would inevitably make us late for class because I was stuck in the bathroom then too. My bowels would spasm without relief, sometimes in middle school, and I would miss parts of English or math class because my belly would hurt and I just couldn't get any relief. But to be honest with you, I never thought any of this re was related to constipation. Actually, I didn't really think about it at all. It was a nuisance, a disruption in my day, and even today, I don't really think about my diagnosis of IBS-C until I'm in the thick of it and constipated for over a week. I was 17 years old when I returned from a day trip to the beach with a terrible stomach ache, worse than, than normal. And let me pause here and say that I was writing, when I was writing down my thoughts for this presentation and thinking about that time in my life, I always get a little sad. 
my constipation was nothing new. And again, it wasn't really even something I thought about, um, but this was something completely different. A stomach ache that would change my life forever. My GI problems that had kept me from class and other activities were about to turn into a five-year period where increasingly I was no longer able to function. I ended up going to my primary care doctor six times that, that year, and I saw two gastroenterologists before being diagnosed with IBSC and, and provided very little medical or psychological help. I went to college the next year and became increasingly withdrawn. Who could enjoy ice cream socials, college meal plans, or McDonald's at 1 a.m. when you're afraid to eat? And that's what happened to me. I would later be diagnosed with severe functional abdominal pain syndrome, later renamed centrally mediated abdominal pain syndrome, which I guess because nobody was very functional when they had it. At that time, when I was 17 years old, I was diagnosed with IBSC or IBS with constipation. And the only medication I was prescribed for the abdominal pain was an anticholinergic medication called Levsin. <clears throat> the purpose of this medication was to decrease the spasms and the pain I was feeling, which of course made the constipation worse, and in turn, the abdominal pain worse. I started my career in pharmacy school, but switched to nutritional science because the pain was causing me to eat less and less. And if you want, and if you are a patient or a caregiver of a patient watching this right now, you'll know that the daily pain, that, that besides the daily pain, the only thing worse is the social isolation of having a chronic GI disorder, which leads to this endless cycle. You have pain, you're afraid to eat, which is normally what most social situations are around. You don't wanna eat, you don't wanna go out with friends, you become more isolated and the pain gets worse and which makes you not wanna eat. That was my life. I missed out on all my college experiences. I missed out on Dunkin' Runs and late night cram sessions. I spent four years in the bathroom or curled up in bed. I was 105 pounds when I graduated with my bachelor's in nutrition depressed and not sure if I would ever be able to hold down a job. It was in 2009, one month short of five years since that day at the beach, that I found my fourth and last gastroenterologist. I was diagnosed with functional abdominal pain syndrome and was able to break that vicious cycle. I remember very clearly starting a new medication about a week later, realizing that I was pain-free for the first time in five years, which of course didn't last, but it, uh, and it took a, a, a good amount of time to rebuild my life again. And I still have IBSC. But now I have better tools to handle it. I continue to take prescription medications, Miralax daily, and eat different types of fruits and vegetables that work best for my GI tract and my constipation. Constipation happens for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it's a side effect of medication. Sometimes, like me, you're just born that way. Whatever the cause or the treatment, it's important to listen to your body and never give up fighting for your own medical needs. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Cecile and IFFGD, for inviting me here today. Hi, my name is Brooks Cash. I am uh, the Dan and Lily Sterling Professor of Medicine and Division Chief of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, at the Houston, Texas Medical Center. And it's my privilege to be able to give you an introduction today on diarrhea. Now, in terms of diarrhea, this can mean many things to many people. So what patients will typically describe as diarrhea are loose stools, or increased stool frequency, or both, or a sense of fecal urgency. It's important for clinicians to actually ask patients what they mean by the term diarrhea. And usually, as I mentioned, it, it implies looser or watery stool, but there are some patients who actually 
do equate the increase in frequency, even if they're having normal stool form as diarrhea. And that's really not, that's something that we call pseudo diarrhea. And this is a very common condition diarrhea is. Acute diarrhea accounts for about 180 million cases per year in the US and chronic diarrhea is a little less uh, known in terms of its prevalence, but it's thought to uh, be present in about one to 5% of the population in developed countries. So important topics. Now, in terms of how we define diarrhea, it is based on the Bristol stool form scale. Uh, I often will consider type five along with diarrhea. Classically, it's type six and type seven. This is a, a way that patients and clinicians can characterize the water content of stool. And it goes all the way from the classic skibbolus or rabbit pellet-like stools and, and hard lumpy stools, type one and two, those are constipated stools, three through five considered normal. As I mentioned, five uh, can asso be associated with some diarrhea as well, and then six and seven with diarrhea. Now we have a couple of classifications of diarrhea. And when we talk to patients about this and even to each other as clinicians, this really sets the tone in terms of our, of our nomenclature. So acute diarrhea is diarrhea that lasts less than two weeks. And that almost always is infectious, whether it's viral or bacterial, usually run its, runs its course and goes away as the body fights off the infection. Persistent diarrhea is greater than 14 days, but less than four weeks. And then chronic diarrhea is greater than four weeks. Now, persistent diarrhea is most often also infectious, although non-infectious causes can certainly play a role there. And then chronic diarrhea is mostly non-infection. Uh, non infectious diarrhea rarely lasts more than four weeks. There can be some, uh, specifically things like uh, giardia or clostridium difficile. And I also had a fourth category there. This is intermittent diarrhea. This is diarrhea that comes and goes uh, with asymptomatic intervals. This could be infection. It could also be consistent with irritable bowel syndrome with either diarrhea or a mixed IBS pattern. So uh, a little tougher to tease out. Now, there's other ways that we can characterize diarrhea. It's not just the symptoms of increasing frequency uh, and decreasing stool consistency, but also stool weight. And by definition, the criteria for uh, diarrhea in terms of increasing uh, fecal output is more than 200 grams per 24 hours. Uh, and that equates to at least 200 mLs of water per 24 hours. A very broad differential diagnosis exists for diarrhea. You know, most people want to blame their diarrhea on their diet. And sometimes that can play a role. Excessive caffeine, excessive fiber, excessive alcohol, all of those things can be associated with diarrhea. The malabsorption or maldigestion of sugars such as lact or sucrose, uh, as well as starches can play a role. Maldigestion of celiac, uh, or I'm sorry, of gluten can play a role. Uh, that's commonly seen in celiac disease. So, you know, lots of different causes. Some are very benign, some are more serious. Crohn's disease, um, chronic pancreatic insufficiency, so things like that. And so this is not meant to be an all-inclusive list, but these are the things that should be going through clinicians' heads uh, and thoughts when they are confronted with a patient with chronic diarrhea. Now I wanna come back to a couple of different classifications. What I'll typically do in, in my practice, and I encourage my trainees to do this, is try and determine whether or not patients are having secretory diarrhea or osmotic diarrhea. Osmotic diarrhea, gets better when people don't take in food. It's still taking uh, fluid, but not food. And the whole concept here is that there is an osmotic gradient. There's a solute in the gut that's trapping water, or actually bringing water in and leading to the diarrhea. So if you eliminate those solutes, and an example of this would be like lactose maldigestion or uh, perhaps celiac disease would be another one or uh, maldigestion of sucrose. Uh, all of those will get broken down by bacteria in our gut, those sugars and carbohydrates and proteins that can lead to some inflammation microscopically, but more importantly, the creation of a high osmotic gradient, which traps water, almost like a bowel prep would do. And that's why people get uh, diarrhea with an osmotic diarrhea. Now that's to contrast that moving to the left of the slide 
with what's called a secretory diarrhea. This an example of this would be something like cholera. You can have a patient fast or, or starve them for a day, and they will continue to have diarrhea because they're actively secreting fluid into the GI tract. This is most commonly seen with infection and very rarely some um, tumors that can secrete uh, hormones that lead to active secretion, but also ingestion of laxatives and uh, other things. It's one of the basis of our laxative therapy for constipation. Now, another classification, which is a little bit more intuitive, would be trying to figure out whether the diarrhea is inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Non-inflammatory pretty much speaks for itself. There's an absence of blood. There's no uh, fevers, um, you know, no uh, fecal leukocytes when we look under the microscope, which is a test that we don't do that much anymore, but not, not a, a huge uh, urgency or feeling like patients have to go all the time. Whereas inflammatory diarrhea, there's going to be blood and mucus in the stool, fevers, uh, a high degree of tenesmus, having that, that sense of having to go all the time, abdominal pain. It's usually small volume, frequent bowel movements. Dehydration is not typical with inflammatory diarrhea. Uh, and then when we take biopsies or look with an endoscopy, the uh, lining of the colon is often inflamed or abnormal. Now, most patients with chronic diarrhea, greater than four weeks in duration, are going to end up having what's called functional diarrhea. Some of these patients may have irritable bowel syndrome if abdominal pain is present. Another large group of patients has this condition, functional diarrhea. And it's defined simply as loose or watery stools without abdominal pain or bothersome bloating at least 25% of the time with defecation. And there's some criteria that are you know, listed here in terms of how long patients should have symptoms. But this would be the majority of people who show up with chronic diarrhea. It's either irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea or a mixed pattern of, of irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea and constipation, or perhaps functional diarrhea. That being said, because of the very broad differential diagnosis of diarrhea, we do end up doing a pretty extensive uh, diagnostic evaluation in these patients. In terms of evaluation, we absolutely want to take a good dietary history. We want to make sure that patients are, are meet that minimal criteria for, for diarrhea. We want to ask them what their diarrhea symptoms are. There are some alarm features that we ask about, unintentional weight loss, a family history of gastrointestinal disease, recent travel, recent antibiotic use, um, physical exam that may show something. If we find those alarm features, those patients should have a more directed, more in-depth diagnostic evaluation. This is a very busy slide, but this is what the Rome Committee recommends uh, be the part of the process with regards to diagnosing patients with chronic diarrhea. And it goes over many of the things I've just said. There are some diagnostic tests that are listed here. And these diagnostic tests are designed to look for inflammation in the, in the GI tract, to assess for anemia, to test the thyroid function, to uh, look for infection in the gut. Um, there are some other tests that are listed that we may end up doing that are uh, suggested, but not necessarily uh, the law of the land. Most of the time, these will be normal, and we will end up treating patients empirically, which simply means that we try them on anti-diarrheal agents. And usually, that's to take the form of um, over-the-counter anti-diarrheal agents, but may actually end up being prescription therapies. We may end up doing colonoscopy in patients, especially if they're older and they have new onset diarrhea. That's a good excuse for us also to accomplish their colon cancer screening. If they have any markers suggesting organic disease, then more than likely we'll end up doing a colonoscopy with biopsies as well. But this, even though it looks a bit complicated, it is a relatively simple pathway that we should follow for patients with diarrhea. Now, if we move over and talk about the treatment, there's uh, a number of goals that we have. We want to improve stool consistency. We want to harden up the stool. That should give our patients uh, enough time to feel that stool burden and get to a, a toilet for, with a socially acceptable venue and uh, not have them have accidents. We want to reduce the stool frequency and we wanted to reduce the stool weight. And there's four major ways that the medications that we use for diarrhea work. They either slow down gastrointestinal motility or movement. They increase absorption of solutes and fluid from the GI tract into the blood of the body. Uh, they block intestinal secretion of fluid or inflammatory mediators, 
and they modify enteric contents. And the example of those last would be something like probiotics or perhaps even antibiotics. So they affect the bacterial environment of the gut. And there's a long list of therapies that we can use as antidiarrheal drugs. What I've done with this list is I've highlighted the most commonly used and most widely accepted and studied therapies. Now, many of these are, some of these are FDA approved therapies for diarrhea, especially in the form of irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, some of these are over the counter therapies. So an example of opioid receptor agonists or modulators would include something like loperamide, which is modium, or diphenoxylate atropine, which is lamodal, or perhaps even eloxadiline, which is viberzi. The latter is a, the last is an FDA approved therapy for IBS with diarrhea. A 5-HT3 receptor antagonist is uh, a serotonin type 3 antagonist. An example of that would be something like uh, Elocitron or Lotrinex, another FDA approved therapy for diarrhea. Most of the time, it's very appropriate to start with over-the-counter therapy. What I'll usually recommend my patients do if I haven't found a, a cause for their diarrhea is have them start on one or two Imodium every day, and then we'll ramp that up uh, and try to get control of their diarrhea. If they have abdominal pain, significant bloating, then I may use another agent along the lines of the FDA approved therapies. So let me just bring it this home and, and summarize everything that we talked about. Diarrhea is very, very common. It has a substantial burden on patients with the condition, but also their caregivers and the healthcare system. It's important to classify and characterize the diarrhea. Is it acute or chronic? Is it persistent? Uh, is it an osmotic versus secretory form? Is it inflammatory versus non-inflammatory? We evaluate diarrhea by taking a good history, doing a good physical exam, and then using um, uh, cognitive and, and directed testing uh, when appropriate. First line therapies, diet modifications, lifestyle modifications, and over-the-counter therapies. The first two are more difficult and they're less successful, but they can help people. Changing your diet or changing your lifestyle can be very effective. Uh, for diarrhea in some people, but more often than not, we will end up having to use some form of therapy, over-the-counter therapies with um, anti-diarrheal drugs like uh, loperamide or diphenoxylate atropine are very appropriate, and then escalating to uh, FDA-approved prescription therapies such as rifaximin, which is an antibiotic, eloxadiline, or elocitron is appropriate for many patients. And those do have the best clinical trial evidence. But as I said, there's many different ways to manage this. The key is to get patients to talk to us about it and recognize that there are effective therapies uh, for this condition. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I look forward to, to hopefully seeing you again soon and being able to share more with regards to functional gastrointestinal disorders or disorders of gut-brain interaction. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Sirota, and I live in the Los Angeles, California area. One day in the summer of 1990, after going out to lunch with my family, I had a sudden urge to go to the bathroom. From that began my 30-year journey with irritable bowel syndrome and diarrhea. I had, at that time, I had had several uh, different issues with my GI for the previous 17 years, but it wasn't major and I could live with it. It just had an occasional upset stomach, occasional diarrhea, even occasional incontinence at that time. But after that lunch in 1990, I started having diarrhea every single day. And that was unusual. So I eventually went to my doctor who uh, took a soul culture, which turned out to be negative mostly, but there was blood in the stool. She referred me to a gastroenterologist. The GI did all of the blood tests, testing for thyroid use, testing for infection, and eventually my first colonoscopy. All the tests, including the colonoscopy, turned out to be negative. He then diagnosed me as having irritable bowel syndrome. And he prescribed Xanax and told me it was all due to stress. 
He also restricted my diet. So for about a year and a half, all I had was grilled meat, grilled chicken, rice, potatoes, bread, and an occasional coffee or Coca-Cola. I lost 20 pounds. I was eating no vegetables, no salads, no other starches, nothing that would might aggravate my GI. I was starting to becoming addicted to Xanax. So I talked to my doctor about getting off of it or getting a substitute med. He would not hear of it. He basically dismissed my concern. At which point then I started to see a different doctor who helped me to get off the uh, Xanax. But the diarrhea continued, the upset stomach continues. I had some days when I was in a lot of pain and a couple of times I had to uh, turn down invitations of going anywhere because I, I was either in pain or I was dreading having another uh, diarrhea episode. I remember one night um, coming home from a, a late night coffee and uh, snack with some friends that I had to stop on the way to get to a bathroom. And that happens, happened several times that I have to stop whatever I'm doing to make sure that I get to a bathroom on time. I started to see a new doctor since I wasn't happy with the, the you know, one I was seeing. And um, he, uh, he, weaned me, he helped me to wean myself off the uh, Xanax and I started taking Imodium. Again, this was the beginning of a 30 year use of Imodium every single day of my life. Um, at the time, the uh, Imodium was a prescription drug, so I had to uh, get it renewed every month or so to be able to have, uh, to be able to take two a day. The new doctor also put me on uh, Bentel. At that time, the ge uh, generic for Bentel was probanthine. Now it's dicyclamin, but it was a different name then, but it was Bentel. And for a long time, I was taking two Imodium and one Bentel every day to control the diarrhea. Finally, about an, a year and a half into this, I started to go to try alternative medicine. I saw an acupuncture, chiropractic, psychologist, homeopathic doctor. I tried everything and nothing was working. The acupuncturist referred me to a, an herbalist or Chinese herbalist. And I started using cooking and, and uh, drinking the uh, hot teas made out of these raw herbs. It was uh, pretty disgusting, but it actually worked better than anything else I had tried at that time. Um, so I, I, I kept using the herbs for a while. Uh, unfortunately, my insurance with my work changed and they were no longer covering alternative medicine practitioners. So I had to stop going to the herbalist. Um, in during that time, I was taking, um, uh, besides the Imodium, I was also taking psyllium or a tripe psyllium, uh, citrusel, donatel, continued restricting my diet. Once I, once I had been on the uh, Chinese herb, I was able to eat some vegetables and salad. But even so, I was limiting the amount. Uh, the other drugs I tried at that point, um, amitriptyline, lepsin, flagyl, decipramin, Wellcol, Lomotil, antidepressants, Gas X, Gaviscon, and several other supplements that are not necessarily recognized by the uh, allopathic uh, medicine doctors. Um, so one year, uh, I also have um, ectopic uh, beats, heartbeats, so uh, or palpitations. One year, my cardiologist gave me verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker for the palpitation. And lo and behold, the verapamil really helped the IBS as well. I had normal stools and almost no diarrhea. It still had some breakthrough, but it was very rare. Unfortunately, the verapamil uh, affected my heart in a negative way and it slowed it down too much. And so I had to get off the verapamil. And as soon as I was off the verapamil, the uh, diarrhea came back. I joined several support groups. Uh, groups that taught meditation, they taught mindfulness. I went to a psychologist. I, had, I think I tried everything that was available at the time and nothing was really changing it. I, the, the Imodium and the Bentel controlled it, but I would still have diarrhea a lot of times. I had tried several different providers, G, regular GIs as well as the alternative medicine. Um, but again, nothing really worked long-term or consistently. 
in uh, 2013, I believe, I uh, actually had a consultation with a Dr. Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and um, he prescribed Pepto-Bismol. He says, that's all I needed. Well, that obviously had not worked either, so um, that wasn't good enough for me. And I started seeing a naturopath. I saw the naturopath for almost a year. And she gave me lots. She did all kinds of stool testing, which are not done by uh, in Western medicine. And she prescribed all kinds of supplement. I also went on a low FODMAP diet at the time, but um, those things just didn't work. I kept on having problems. I kept on having diarrhea. Finally, I heard about the Cedar sinai Motility Clinic and the work Dr. Pimentel was doing. So I was able to get an appointment with one of the doctors in the clinic. It did take six months to get to see him. Um, meanwhile, the, my regular GI at, at uh, Cedars um, did a breath test and prescribed rifaximin or cifaxan, which was now the go-to antibiotic for people who had IBS with diarrhea. Um, and two tested positive on the breath test, which I did. And I tried to wean myself off the emodium because it was not really working anymore. Um, when I finally got the appointment with somebody at this motility clinic um, and he had the results of the test, he prescribed rifaximin, which helped a little bit. It cut down on the, uh, the, you know, the constant diarrhea I had. But my doctor also prescribed Zofran, which is not necessarily uh, meant for IBS per se, but it's uh, anti-nausea medicine. And it does, and one of the side effects is constipation. So the uh, Zofran worked for a while and I was free of diarrhea for like a year and a half or so. And then the Zofran, like, like the emotive before that, the, uh, the Zofran stopped working. Uh, the doctor at the Cedars cl uh, Clinic tried a couple of times to, um, we tried different things at that time. We tried um, digestive en enzymes. We tried um, antihistamines. We tried, uh, I forget all of the, specifically what we did. We tried antidepressants. I was on, at one point I, I tried out four different antidepressants over the years. We tried antifungal medicine, medication. Nothing really worked. Um, when the Zof after the Zofran stopped working, I started again taking Imodium every single day and an occasional Bentil. But even that wasn't enough. And I've had uh, breakthrough cases of diarrhea. I've had uh, uh, fecal incontinence. I've had stomach pains, some nausea. Um, it's Nothing has really worked consistently or um, permanently. Um, so where am I right now? I am on four medications that help to control the diarrhea. Imodium, Bentil or Dicyclamin, IB Guard, which is peppermint capsule, and immunoglobulin. I started with the immunoglobulin back in about six, eight months ago in December, taking something called Antaragam. And that did control the diarrhea, but because it's kind of difficult to swallow, I switched to an immunoglobulin capsule. Um, of all those four medicines, I have no idea which one works and which one doesn't. But I know that if I stop taking one of them, everything comes back. All of the loose, watery diarrhea comes back. I've had fecal incontinence maybe a dozen times in the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, this past two years has been worse, even worse than before. Um, I was in an event where I was responsible to take care of an issue. And unfortunately, I wound up having to run to the bathroom and stay there for a while because I couldn't come out. Um, the anxiety of having an accident is overwhelming at times. I've had panic attacks. Uh, I break out in a cold sweat or a hot sweat. Uh, I get chills. I feel um, unable to really live a normal life. It has taken over my my mind and my life. Um, 
I have to wa always watch what I eat. And now I'm back on the low fat diet much more strictly than I was before. I'm really following it. So that also has helped. But I can't, I'm very limited in what I eat. And there's many different things I cannot eat at all. I certainly cannot have any dairy products. Um, I cannot have garlic and onions. I cannot have uh, a lot of different vegetables. I'm limited. I cannot have any beans. And still the the same staple food that I had, that I uh, ate 20 years ago or 30 years ago are still the ones that are my safe, safe foods. Grilled meat, grilled chicken, rice, potatoes. Um, but I do eat limited vegetables and limited salads, raw food. Uh, going out to eat is a real problem because it's not just the main food that's the problem. It's however they're cooked, what is put, you know, the spices or flavorings that are put in the, in the food. Um, I have tried, besides the low fat diet, I have tried um, a low fermentation diet as well, the one from Cedars, but it almost doesn't make any difference. Uh, some foods make things worse, but even when I'm very careful with the foods, I can have a breakthrough uh, diarrhea episode, or I have this terrible gas pains, or this burning feeling. There's so many symptoms that go with it, but the the diarrhea, which is unpredictable, erratic, uncontrollable, urgent, is really the, the, the worst of the problems. Um, it impacts my life. It has impacted my life for 30 years now and possibly before that, some 47 years. Uh, I have over the years, I have seen 25 or 30 providers, both gastroenterologists and, and uh, alternative medicine providers. And I have tried over 50 different meds or supplements. And still the Imodium is the one that works the best. and diarrhea and we've had some questions from the audience that have come in on chat and some discussion that that we are going to have here with Dr. Bill Che from the University of Michigan and Dr. Lin Chang from CLA. So to start with we had a great question from the audience and that is um, Dr. Limbo, Tony mentioned the rectal exam and that I know is something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable so is it really necessary? How important is it? Yeah, I think it's it's potentially very important. Let me just say that to some extent, when you do it is highly variable, it will depend on the, the provider. So for example, if you have a patient that comes in with typical constipation symptoms on the first visit, I may very well try some over-the-counter laxative therapies. And if the patient gets better, I'm not necessarily going to worry about doing a, a rectal exam. On the other hand, if they come back and they haven't gotten better, or if they have really severe symptoms to start, I'm probably going to want to do a rectal exam. And I think the big thing for, for people that are listening to understand is that this is embarrassing for you, but it's not for us at all. You know, I will always say things like as a little bit of a joke, but it's not. And that is that um, to us, a rectal exam is our bread and butter. You know, it, it really is something that's part and parcel of our usual physical examination. We don't think anything of it, and nor should you. Okay, don't be embarrassed about, about getting a, rec a rectal examination done. In fact, I would argue to you this. If, you, if you've seen a gastroenterologist multiple times for constipation or fecal incontinence and you've never gotten a rectal exam, there's something wrong there. Which is entirely possible. Yes. Because people are doing less of it, but it is important. Absolutely. And it's really important, particularly because in, in constipation, because you're looking for a sign that the anal sphincter or the muscle and the pelvic floor muscles are not relaxing appropriately when a patient is on the toilet and, and pushing out. And if that's the case, they could have a functional outlet disorder, which we term dysergic defecation. It's not a great term for patients, but it just means there's not good relaxation of the pelvic floor to straighten out the rectum and evacuate because the treatment's different. 
And the treatment is more of anal rectal biofeedback than just giving patients laxatives or other constipation medications. But I will say that many doctors who do uh, digital rectal examinations, they check for you know, uh, a mass in the rectum, uh, the tone of the anal sphincter, but they actually don't test for the evacuation process, actually asking a patient to, to push out like they're sitting on the toilet to test for that. So I think that's important. The other thing I think is really important is to explain to your patient why you're doing it and what you're going to do so that they can experience, um, expect that, especially young patients. And I think that if you just pull it on them without really explaining, it could be a traumatic experience actually. So it's really important to explain to patients what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. Right. And for those of you at home, if, if you have, are in a, a visit with your healthcare provider and they say they want to do a digital rectal exam, you can ask them the question, exactly why are you doing it? And can you explain to me exactly what you're going to do? And then they can tell you the steps and they'll be able to, to tell you, well, first of all, I'm going to ask you to bear down or I'm going to check for a mass in your rectum, that sort of thing. So feel free to ask those questions so that you're comfortable before you actually have that exam. You know, another thing too is that if you are uncomfortable, first of all, at all large medical centers, they're, they're going to have a chaperone that accompanies the physician, male or female. But if that isn't the case in, in a community setting where a patient's being seen, you can ask for a chaperone if that makes you feel more comfortable. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. Um, don't be hesitant or shy about uh, doing that if you want somebody else in the room just to help you to feel more comfortable. I've had patients actually refuse mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, they don't, they're not comfortable doing it right. even when you talk about it. And that's, that's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, that's a great, great topic to talk about or especially talk about constipation. So, um, moving on to if someone has both constipation and diarrhea, how does that, um, how does that happen? And what is that? Well, often uh, patients can, well, first of all, it can't be from taking medications that they're alternating, just say, just spontaneously. It, it is a sign of irritable bowel syndrome if the patient has pain and they have constipation diarrhea, which typically, and Bill and I have talked about this a lot, a lot. Typically what you see is like three to five days of constipation where you have hard stools or no stool, and then you get a day or two of diarrhea and they go into this cycle. Um, and it's and it's really important to know what this uh, the cycle is and this uh, the daily di this is where daily diary is helpful. But often, if you can try to get on top of the constipation, treat it proactively, you can reduce the symptoms and reduce the diarrhea days, mm -hmm. reduce the frequency and intensity. So that's good. The other thing to think about is it's called overflow, like a fecal loading. So where patients can have a lot of stool, particularly on the right side of the colon, which you can actually palpate on abdominal exam. Mm -hmm. And the, when you're trying to treat the constipation, the loose stool gets around the, the harder stool and it comes out as diarrhea. And often you have to really try to clean out the bowels. And so you can start again so that they don't have this overflow uh, type of diarrhea. And some people will actually get a abdominal x-ray to see if there's a lot of stool and that if that's the case, when they're having constipation diarrhea, they'll actually do more of a cleansing and then, and then start on the treatment. You know, there are some really cool um, mobile apps that are available now that can help patients to sort through this. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's uh, a couple that allow you to take pictures of your stool on a daily basis, and then it will track the consistency and other features of your bowel movements over time. So it can help you to sort through exactly what Lynn's talked about, which is that I oftentimes talk to patients about um, order in the chaos. So um, people feel that their stools are actually really chaotic and unpredictable, but then when you actually track them over time, there's actually a pattern there. You know, they'll have those small, hard, lumpy, or no stools for several days, and then, then you know, diarrhea. So. The, the, a couple apps to think about, one is called Dieta, okay. D-I-E-T-A. -E uh, the other one is called Carta, and those are actually both um, apps that allow you to track your stools over time by taking, taking photos of it. Fantastic. And we'll, um, we'll put that information in the chat for you at home.